So, listen to this. Imagine you made it as a footballer. Imagine you had thousands of fans jokingly calling you the next Messi. You were getting sponsorships left and right, making millions a year, driving around in Lamborghinis and Rolls Royces, you know, just living the dream. Well, if you were in that position, just exactly how much would you be willing to risk in order to make even more money? Would you risk your entire football career? Would you risk all your sponsorships, your ability to even enter your own country? Would you risk going to jail? I bet that 99% of you would answer no to every single one of those questions, but there's one person who was actually faced with all of those dilemmas and actually decided to risk it all, going from being one of the hottest prospects in Europe, being nicknamed Pro Messi, taking Player of the Year awards, leading goal-scoring charts, to entering a life of crime, being caught up in multiple investigations, being charged with attempted murder, and being accused of smuggling for 1,000 kilos of cocaine, eventually being forced to flee the country, leaving his career behind to live like an exile in Moscow. If you haven't caught wind of it yet, I'm talking about Quincy Promes. Get it? Promessi? Yeah. Regardless, today we're gonna look into what happened, what is going to happen, and whether or not there was any way to predict this would happen. Because, well, while I'll try not to be too judgmental, I have to say that out of all of the players in the world, it isn't exactly surprising that Promise was the one to go down this route. Let's just say, he's always been sort of problematic. Look, at around the age of 10, he was already skipping class all the time, and while this wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if he was at least doing something productive with his time, that didn't seem to be the case, as by the age of 16, despite being one of the most promising young talents at Ajax, the team ended up literally expelling him from their academy on account of his bad behavior. We never really got a good explanation as to what kind of behavior was bad enough to warrant an action like that, but as Promise himself would say, I was never an easy boy to deal with. I know that. I had no idea what I needed to do to get to the top, I loved chaos, and I never held my tongue for anyone. Still, I guess you could say he had a soft side, as he did also admit that on that day, though he made sure to stand tall as he left the academy, he ended up bursting into tears the moment he arrived at home. In fact, hadn't it been for his mom picking him up and insisting that he had to keep on playing, he would have quit football for good. He really did feel that without Ajax he had no shot at making it, but yeah, he was completely wrong. In his first year away from Ajax, he ended up joining Arlem, which, sure, it was just a second tier club that would literally go extinct by 2010, however, the year after that, he had already earned a move to Twenta, another of the country's top clubs, and by the third year, he had signed his first professional contract, got his debut in the Eredivisie, and just three months after that, he was sent on loan to Go Ahead Eagles in the second tier. Sure, it wasn't top flight football, he wasn't in the limelight, but for someone who was convinced he'd end up working a 9-to-5 job just three years before, this was an incredible comeback, and it only became better when once things got going at his new club. Just guess who was his coach there. Just a 43-year-old rookie manager taking on his first senior job after years of coaching at youth level and a forgettable career as a centre-back. His name was Eric Ten Hag. And yeah, he did work out some of his magic, leading Promise to an inconsistent yet incredible year that saw him go on some nasty goal-scoring streaks that eventually led him to finish the year with 17 goals and 11 assists from an offensive midfielder role, quickly becoming a fan favorite at his new team, finally getting the infamous nickname Promessi and leading the club to an hopeful 6th place finish that earned him a place in the promotional playoffs, pulling off 3 goals across the 3 rounds as well as an assist shocking the country by putting go-ahead eagles back on top after nearly a decade in the second tier. Regardless, with performances like these, not only did he take the award for best young player in the country, but he left Twenta with no choice but to bring him back, and man, it just didn't stop. By November, he had gone on an incredible streak with 12 goal contributions in 13 matches, literally being named the best player in the country for that first half of the season but only after he had gone down in a match, coming off with a knee injury and being rushed to surgery. As you might imagine, everyone was worried, but faster than they could imagine, Promise was back on the pitch, scoring or assisting in all of his first four games back and even earning his first call up to the national team in a place in the 30-man squad for the World Cup preparation stage. By the end of the year, Promise had offers from everyone from Juventus to Valencia, but despite that, he still went for Spartak Moscow instead. 
Look, this wasn't as surprising as it may seem. All the way back in Go Ahead Eagles, his teammates had nicknamed him Money Wolf. As weird as that nickname may sound, the reason behind it was quite clear. Promise was always money hungry. His teammates would always listen to him talk about how he was waiting for his big money move. On social media, he was always showing off whatever expensive jewelry and clothes he had. He surely was never a modest guy. In fact, he had frequently been criticized for being so extravagant, at one point even deleting all of his Instagram posts as a way to show that he was determined to focus on his career. But well, not only did that change in behavior not last, but the move to Spartak led a lot of people to lose faith in him. Especially as his first season there ended up being a bit underwhelming, settling for just 13 goals and 5 assists, leaving him in an awkward position, still winning the award for being the club's best player, despite the fact it would already be be forced to deny rumors that he'd be leaving. Still, thankfully, I guess, he didn't leave and instead went on to massively improve the next season, being named player of the month in August, September, October and November, finally admitting there was some truth to the transfer rumors by the time New Year's came around and then igniting them even further by going on maybe the greatest streak of his career with 18 goal contributions in 18 matches, being named the league's second best player and leading Inter Milan and Liverpool to come out gun for his transfer, only for Promise to once again disappoint everyone by instead signing a contract renewal that ensured he would get more money than ever. And I guess it did pay off for Spartak, as despite some injuries stopping him here and there, Promise hit some of his best numbers ever, topping the league's assist charts while pulling off 12 goals as well, getting close to a goal contribution every 100 minutes and eventually scoring the goal that would make Spartak league champions for the first time in 16 years. When Promise was asked if that had been the best season of his career, he simply answered, let the people decide before once again ignoring interest from an European giant, this time Manchester United, and going on to play yet another season with Spartak, finally topping the league's goal-scoring shards, once again improving on his previous form, this time with 31 goal contributions, even pulling off maybe the greatest performance of his career with two goals and two assists against Sevilla, leading Spartak to an unfathomable 5-1 win over the Spanish side, despite the fact they only managed 32% possession. Of course, this once again brought him some rewards. First, the award for Russian Footballer of the Year, as well as a £25 million transfer bid by Southampton. And though Promise would once again insist on staying for a while, when Spartak lost out on the Champions League playoffs, he finally let go and joined none other than Sevilla, who were clearly still shocked with what they had seen just a few months earlier. However, it has to be said, that transfer sucked. But when Sevilla's overly defensive football up bunch of managerial changes and their insistence on playing Promise everywhere on the pitch except for his actual natural role, at one point even deploying him as a left back. No wonder he barely scored any goals that season, leaving the club after just one year and running back to the manager who pretty much made his career, joining Tanag once more, this time at Ajax, where soon things would go very, very wrong. With his market value plummeting following such a disappointing season, Promise surprised everyone by once again bouncing back seamlessly, pulling off 10 goals and 3 assists in the opening 14 league games, scoring against every team he faced in the Champions League group stage and even pulling off a man of the match performance in a 4 goal draw against Chelsea. But just as everyone was waiting for him to fire everything up to a whole new level, Promise was detained by the police as a suspect in a stabbing incident that had happened all the way back in July, before he had even debuted for Ajax. According to the reports, Promise was in a family birthday party completely drunk when he got into a feud with one of his cousins over a 3000 euro necklace he had supposedly stolen from his aunt, eventually getting into a physical argument, yelling out that he would kill him and then stabbing him in his knee, rupturing his ligaments. Though Promise would soon be released as he awaited trial, struggling with two injuries and all the media attention he was getting for his court case, his form dropped massively over the next six months, even being dropped from the World Cup squad as the Federation decided they couldn't risk having a criminal in the squad. And so, by February of the following year, he had moved to Spartak once again. But if you're thinking that this transfer only came as a result of his poor form, you're very much wrong. Let's just say it came very late into the winter transfer market and conveniently, right after it became clear that Promise would be charged with attempted murder. 
Speaking of things being oddly convenient, Russia obviously has no extradition agreements with the Netherlands, meaning that just as things got ugly, Promise found himself in a position where he was completely invulnerable and above the law. Regardless, at that moment, there was no actual evidence against Promise. It seemed almost self-incriminating for him to run away the way he did, but well, he probably knew a lot more than we did. You see, back in 2020, the Dutch police managed to intercept four tons of cocaine that were being stored in a harbor. Soon after, several people closely related to Quincy Promise, including some family members, were charged and eventually detained for drug trafficking and money laundering. This could have easily been a mere coincidence, the police initially had no actual way to justify the start of an investigation against Promise, but that was before something became quite obvious. Promise kept receiving calls from the people who were imprisoned. Over time, it became more and more obvious they were likely more than friends, they were associates. And so the police ended up tapping Quincy's phone, hoping to record some kind of confession of his association to that case, but what they didn't expect was that they would catch him confessing to something entirely different. On the day after the stabbing, before the police was even aware of the occurrence, they listened in as Promise made a call to his father at 1am. In that call, his father said, why are you coming for that cousin of yours, Quincy? I don't want you to get in trouble. And right then you could hear Promise reply, it was either that or I would kill him. Don't you get it? Then, briefly after hanging up the phone, two more calls occur, one to his mother and another to his aunt. His mother informs him his cousin is on the way to the hospital, yes, where he got hit. She replies, in his leg. And Promise once again is heard saying, then he got lucky. Following that statement in the call to his aunt, he tells her, I can't let nobody steal from us. I couldn't help myself. Sorry, aunt. Please forgive me, but I couldn't resist it. I love you too much. And finally, he calls his father once more and tells him, My loyalty is to my aunt. Whoever steals from her, I will kill. Period. There are people in this family I would kill for, I don't care. If they disrespect you, they'll see who I really am, not the footballer, but the other side of me. It was lucky I don't carry a gun anymore, or it would have been much uglier. As you might imagine, by the time the next season started, the police had indeed decided to persecute him, the evidence was just overwhelming. But conveniently, once again, the trial was delayed as one of the key participants fell ill, and even though he had to watch from afar as all of his assets in the Netherlands were seized by the authorities, he finally managed to get back to decent form, though it all felt a bit futile, with Spartak finishing 10th place regardless. As the months followed and the current season began, the police began preparing their case. Then the trial was delayed again as Quincy's lawyers began questioning the validity of the evidence. Eventually, though it wasn't actually deemed invalid, the charges for attempted murder were dropped, being replaced with aggravated assault. And though the prosecutors had requested a two-year prison sentence, Promise ended up only getting 18 months. Ever since then, his lawyer has confirmed they will appeal the decision, while Spartak has publicly stated that none of this will stop them from playing Promise, who strangely and rather ironically has hit the form of his life ever since the sentencing, scoring 25 goals and getting 10 assists over the last season, averaging a goal contribution every 87 minutes, substantially better than he ever managed to pull. Oddly enough, he also decided this was the perfect time to start releasing music videos of him rapping, which is just wild. But what I think is seems to be forgetting is that the police haven't given up on proving his association with the drug trafficking case, and just last month, they confirmed they had decided to prosecute him for that case as well, claiming he and another man are responsible for importing at least 1.3 tons of cocaine, with a wholesale value of $40 million, all purchased from famous Surinamese drug lord Piet Vortel, who was finally arrested in Aruba a few months ago, having been sentenced to jail in both Spain and the Netherlands, and managing to escape both times. You know, sort of a El Chapo character. Regardless, according to recent claims, Promise had been in debt to Vortel after allowing a rival gang to steal a shipment of about 400 kilos, and the biggest piece of evidence linking him to all of this was this time around an encrypted text they intercepted, in which Promise told his associates the other half is safe, carry on with the job, soon after one of the runners he had hired was caught while he attempted to move half of the shipment from the port to a shisha lounge they were using as a meeting point. I really think Promise should consider putting down the phone once in a while, but regardless, I guess we can say Quincy Proms is now a certified drug lord.